doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. Um, okay, so well, first of all, if I, if I may, I just want to um, add to what you said about the power of pooling and diversification, because dynamic, uh, dynamically managed portfolios um, that are diversified, we went back to this after the financial crisis, that, that works. And um, it's a very powerful concept because when we look at the dramatic need for equity risk um, uh, as, as kind of a starting layer, or any risk, diversification helps. Pooled diversification helps. Um, it helps with debt. It helps with equity. And we're going to have a big meeting in, in, uh, in a couple hours of the MDC where we're focused on what came out of the Macron summit on FX. Same concept. If you give me a basket of currencies and you want to actually lower the, the carry, um, the cost of hedging, um, if I basketize or pool, I can, I can reduce risk. So this is a, uh, a tool that's important when you ask that question of scale because it is a tool in the toolkit, so to speak, um, that's critical. But one of the ways you've got to get there conceptually, right, is you have to you have to have a uh, a vehicle, a facility, or a program above the head of individual projects, right? And that's something that we just haven't seen done. I mentioned in the last session that one of the reasons that we're not uh, blending at scale is that we don't have enough projects. Um, but conceptually, if you could, um, if you could raise billions of dollars of funds above the project level, um, there are a lot of of risk management techniques available um, out there that we could use even in the private sector. Um, for example, many of you may not know that. Uh, I, I have called for, I, I, I said a thousand times, a hundred times, whatever it is, that we need a thousand times the power of MEGA. That if we're really going to do this, we need to guarantee at scale. And we're not doing that. Um, uh, but do you know that MEGA puts 70% of its risk into the insurance industry in private capital markets? So one thing that we at City have looked at, and we did this as advisor to uh, uh, to the COVAX facility on vaccines, because COVAX took risk, as you may know, to on one side negotiate and purchase vaccines from all the vaccine manufacturers in order to get them to the emerging markets countries, um, and it was an NGO, right, that had all that risk. So we said, well, wait a minute, you can't. Is carry that risk. What if some of these EM countries that are supposed to take the vaccines can't pay? We actually went to a consortium of insurance companies that were able to give us a price at speed to insure that side. And I think there's a lot of examples of how we can be much more efficient with um, allocation of, of risk. It's interesting. R risk has to be placed to where it's held best. And a lot of times the world tries to force uh, the wrong risk into someone who can't take that risk. And um, if you look up and down the capital stack, um, I think you're going to speak a little bit about sovereign wealth funds, right? But, but so sovereign, I mean, sovereign wealth funds can actually take a different kind of risk. And you'll, you'll talk about it, but they're very unique in their long duration perspective um, that someone who's uh, marking to market every day can't take, right? Um, there are insurance companies that, quite frankly, you know, you go to the third floor and you sit down and you talk to the development, de I'm sorry, the developed world team uh, about infrastructure, green infrastructure. And they understand infrastructure and can take long duration project risk. But when you say, 
Let's talk about single B. Let's talk about Africa. They're no, no, no. Go to the seventh floor. Go talk to them. So you go up to the seventh floor and you sit down with the EM team and you talk to them. Well, fine until you say, but wait a minute, this is project finance risk. Um, they're like, no, 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 go back down to three. So we have, we have um, a lot of things that go beyond the MDBs in terms of how we can be smarter and faster if we're going to scale the ability to take risk. And we have great new players. We have all these climate funds that have entered into the world. We have philanthropic money to bolt to the ODA problem I mentioned earlier, that there's philanthropic money that will actually step in and, and um, catalyze a debt for sustainability swap or actually put a grant in um, to, get, to, to, to get projects developed faster. Um, and then finally, again, I've tried to stay away from MDBs because I want people to conceptualize that MDBs are the gorilla in the room of a reform effort to get them to mobilize more and take risks differently, structure products that mitigate our risk. But there are other tools out there. And one of the things I tell ministers around the world every day is, you, you have this project, and it's, let's just say it's hydrogen, um, and you're conceptualizing and you're sitting down with all these MDBs and the green NGO community, et cetera, but have you actually talked to the top five players, global sponsors of large corporates, and asked them to come help develop that, country, that, that project for you in the country? Have them do the feasibility study. Has, wh why isn't that happening? Because at the end of the day, that, those global players take equity risk. They can figure out how to finance it, not on your balance sheet as a government. And they may actually, if you meet them halfway in terms of the enabling environment, they'll actually do the feasibility study for you. So why aren't you talking to the private sector aggressively and proactively about that? I'll stop there. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.